Pure Experience and Reality by Evander Bradley McGilvery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pure Experience and Reality by Evander Bradley McGilvery. In this scientific age, no philosopher feels comfortable if he finds that his doctrines bring him into conflict with scientific facts. Scientific theories at variance with his own philosophical theories he can venture to criticize and reject, but facts made out by science he prefers not to deny. As Professor Dewey says, one is entitled to enter a caveat against any attempt to impose science, whether physical or psychological, as philosophy. Yet most empiricists would hardly be willing to adopt any philosophic position of which it could be clearly shown that it depends upon ignoring, denying, or perverting scientific results. Footnote. Journal of Philosophy, Psychology, and Scientific Methods. Volume 3, page 253. Hereafter, this journal will be referred to simply as journal. End footnote. Now the philosophy of pure experience, which has recently been developed by Professors James and Dewey, has been suspected by many of involving just such a denial of scientific results. If the reality of anything is the reality it has as experienced and only when experienced, then it would seem that the sciences which deal with objects purporting to have existed before any verifiable experience do not have to do with reality. Yet these very sciences claim to prove as scientific fact the real existence of objects prior to zoic periods. Hence the philosophers of pure experience feel it incumbent on them to set themselves at rights in this matter. Professor James has recently so defined his position that it ceases to have any anti-realistic suggestions which might bring him into contradiction with the sciences of geology and astronomy. In answer to a question put to him by Mr. Pitkin as to whether his theory precludes the possibility of something not experienced, Professor James says, assuredly not, how could it? Yet in my opinion we should be wise not to consider anything or action of that nature and to restrict our universe of philosophic discourse to what is experienced or, at least, experienceable. Footnote. Journal. Volume 4. Page 106. The italics in the last four words are mine. End footnote. What kind of reality the experienceable has when it is not experienced, Professor James does not tell us, at least in his recent writings. In his psychology, there was no attempt to abbreviate such reality and write it down to a tentative program, waiting for the signature and seal of experience to put it into execution. Likewise, there is nothing in the address on the pragmatic method, delivered before the Philosophic Union of the University of California, which should commit him, so far as one can see, to denying the full and genuine reality of the things which, though not experienced, make a tremendous difference in what we do experience and shall continue to experience. In default, therefore, of any express avowal by Professor James of adherence to the notion that unexperienced but experienceable reality is incomplete reality, one may assume, provisionally at least, that there is nothing in his experientialism to which a scientist may reasonably object on the score that it deprives him of the very objects of his investigation. Whether Professor James's philosophy remains pure experientialism when it is interpreted in the light of the sentences just quoted is another question which does not concern us here. Professor Dewey has taken another course. He has tried to put himself at one with science by admitting something non-contemporaneously experienced. Footnote. Journal, Volume 3, page 254. Italics mine. The quotations from Professor Dewey and what follows are all from his article on reality as experience, in Volume 3 of this journal, pages 253 to 257, except where otherwise designated. And as the article is short and the passages and phrases quoted are easily found in it, I shall not page the references. End footnote. But he also maintains his pure experientialism by qualifying this admission. The pre-experiential something is not to be considered completely real. The readers of Professor Dewey's Studies in Logical Theory must have been prepared for such a statement from him. In that work, he insisted that the object of thought, when it has emerged from the experience of stress and strain and appears in a subsequent tranquil experience as the result of pragmatic adjustment, must not be read back anachronistically into the time preceding the adjustment. The reader was therefore left to infer that no truth made out by intellectual labor is to be held valid of anything real that may have existed before that labor was ended. This inference is now for the first time explicitly confirmed by Professor Dewey in the article just referred to. This article has, therefore, the importance of a definitive statement of his attitude towards facts dealt with in some fundamental sciences. We have here a touchstone of the scientific character of his experiential philosophy. 
If his philosophy cannot stand at this point the test of comparison with the results of science, then that philosophy is anti-scientific. And the pure experientialist of Professor Dewey's type stands at the parting of the ways. Either he must take leave of science, or he must surrender his peculiar views and the logic which issues in these views. We need not here decide which course anyone would reasonably choose with these alternatives before him. We must first see whether these are exclusive and exhaustive alternatives. Professor Dewey himself evidently appreciates the crisis which his system here faces. The article in question is a resolute attempt to avert the crisis. Let us see whether it succeeds. As we have already said, Professor Dewey admits the existence of something prior to experience, something non-contemporaneously experienced. The something, however, though it is called an earlier reality, is not to be set over against the later experience of it, as one complete reality against another. It is only the earlier portion, historically speaking, of what later is experience. So viewed, the question of reality versus experience turns out to be only the question of an earlier version of reality against a later version. Or if the term version be objected to, then of an earlier rendering or expression or state of reality compared with its own later condition. We cannot, however, say an earlier reality versus a later reality, because this denies the salient point of transition towards. Continual transformation in the direction of this is the fact which excludes on the basis of science to which we have agreed to appeal any chopping off of the non-contemporaneously experienced earlier reality from later experience. So viewed, the question for philosophy reduces itself to this. What is the better index for philosophy of reality, its earlier or its later form? In the earlier form, something essential to reality is still omitted, and thus the earlier reality was not really and entirely real. Wanting is what? Summer redundant, blueness abundant, where is the blot? Be me the world, yet a blank all the same, framework which waits for a picture to frame. What of the leafage, what of the flower? Roses embowering with naught they embower. Come then complete, in completion no comer. Pant through the blueness, perfect the summer. Breathe but one breath, rose beauty above. And all that was death, rose life, rose love, grows love. The comer fulfills the promise and potency of the past, immersing the knowledge object which before was only reality in the making in an inclusive, vital, direct experience. And lo, reality is made, perfect and entire, wanting nothing. But it does not remain made for good and all. It has a way of slipping back into its inchoate state every time it ceases to be experienced, every time it is withdrawn from the bath. Reality is invulnerable to philosophical attack only so long as the waters of experience flow over it. But this gives no serious trouble, for it can be dipped again and again. The charm, though momentarily lost, can be regained. Reality is always at hand, a portable bath for anyone who needs it in his pragmatic business. A need is possible only in experience, and experience is itself the magic water. Every experience thus holds and suspense within itself knowledge with its entire object world, however big or little. And the experience here referred to is any experience in which cognition enters. It is not some ideal or absolute or exhaustive experience. Every pre-experiential creature is by experience delivered from the bondage of incompleteness into glorious reality. The vision beatific culminates and reifies the qualitative transformation towards. We have in this theory a daring derealization of the pre-experiential past. What is the justification for it? We are told that the justification is found in the fact that all the objects of which astronomy and geology treat are objects for the scientific experience. When the scientist predicates reality of them apart from his experience of them, he ignores the fact that he is necessary to make this predication and therefore to realize them. This realization of them in his scientific judgment abates the perfection of the reality they had before they were ever experienced. For to realize means to make real. And when the scientist realizes the existence of long bygone things, he makes that existence real. If he makes that existence real, it could not have been real before. For what already is, why doth a man yet make? Recognize that the transformation of pre-experiential qualities towards experience is realized in present experience, and the contradiction vanishes. Since the qualitative transformation was towards experience, where else should its nature be realized save in experience, and in the very experience in which O, the knowledge object, is present? What is omitted from reality in the O is always restored in the experience in which O is present. The O is thus really taken as what it is, a condition of reality as experience. In other words, the world of knowledge is from start to finish a performance, 
going on before the eyes of virginal experience. Even though she cannot bar from the board certain really objective facts, they are not objectionable, for they appear completely clad in robes she has provided. What they might have been before they were thus clothed upon she can never see. Should, perchance, visions of the dressing room flit before her maiden fancy, she merely thinks of the occupants as undergoing continual transformation in the direction of investiture. They could never be real for her, because they become real only when they appear garbed before the footlights. Everything that experience touches is thereby made clean for the grace of her favor, and made whole in the entirety of her embrace. Without such cleansing and such integration, nothing can enter into her presence. The object as it existed before it was experienced was not reality, but only a condition of reality, and the condition is not sufficient to produce reality. Only when the condition is supplemented by an experience which realizes the object does the object become real. It is a great pity that before writing of the realizing power of experience, Professor Dewey had not made as exhaustive a study in some dictionary of the word realize as he has made of the words idea and consciousness, for any even fairly complete dictionary would have shown him that realize means at least two things. One, make real, and two, recognize or think of as real. To argue that, because the nature of the object is realized only in experience, it could not have been completely real before the experience, looks suspiciously like a play upon words. A pun can hardly be a scientific fact, on which are wrecked all strictly objectivistic realisms. The result will not be substantially different if we regard the emphasis which Professor Dewey lays on the word realize in his article as merely the employment of the convenient word to enforce a view obtained otherwise, and not as an attempt to rear a pretentious philosophic structure on such a logical study of language. The foundation of his system is laid on the fact that, before any object can be posited as real, there must be some cognitive experience in which the object is thus posited. Experience, as the presupposition of scientific objects, it is asserted is ignored in the physical sciences which deal with objects and abstract from the experience for which such objects exist as real. The reason the scientist can suppress in his statement of the reality factors which the reality possesses, more specifically the factor of being experienced, is just because, one, he is not interested in the total reality, but in such phases of it as serve as trustworthy indications of imports and projects, and because, two, the elements suppressed are not totally suppressed, but are right there in his experience, in its extra-scientific features. In other words, the scientist can ignore some part of the man's experience, just because that part is so irredeemably there in experience. There is no question that we have here a very important truth, which realism may ignore to its ultimate philosophic undoing. But we have the truth stated in a way that leads to confusion, and it is on this confusion that Professor Dewey builds that part of his philosophy which is anti-realistic. By avoiding the confusion, and yet by recognizing the truth which Professor Dewey expresses, only to impress it wrongfully into the service of a false experientialism, the realist can round off his realism with an idealism. He would thus get an ontological realism and an epistemological idealism. Of course, this result would be an abomination to anyone who abhors the very word epistemology, and who has brought himself to believe that knowing the external world through ideas which are merely within us is an inherent self-contradiction. Footnote, Studies in Logical Theory, page 83. End footnote. The confusion to which I refer is that between the intellectual cognition of a fact as a present experience and a fact cognized as a reality temporally prior to the experience which cognizes it. The former is pure experience in Professor Dewey's meaning of the term. All the mediations by which such a cognition has been attained have also been purely experienced as processes of tension and inner distraction, terminating in purely experienced reintegration of contents, in pure experience of rest after toil, port after stormy seas. Nothing can enter into the kingdom of knowledge and acquire citizenship in the scientific domain with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereunto without having taken out naturalization papers in the court of experience. Without this preliminary process, even a star cannot be domiciled as a star and allowed to stake out a claim to a quarter section in the stellar universe of science. This necessity, that something should first be experienced in some way and then be known in a scientific way, before that thing can be treated by science, does not seem to be overlooked by scientists today. Most of these worthy gentlemen would probably be amused by the suggestion that they could ignore the knowing part of their experience and pay attention only to the known part, because forsooth the knowing part is irredeemably there in experience. What are microscopes and telescopes and spectroscopes, from the epistemological point of view, but eloquent witnesses to the scrupulous extraction the scientist makes that every object should first be experienced before it be inventoried in the scientific catalogue? 
what are the method of least squares and the allowance for personal equation, but the recognition that, whatever may be the final scientific statement, that statement must take as its point of departure the experience of the scientist. The scientific statement is not shut out of a pistol. It is the fruition of a developmental process whose germination and whose fluorescence occur in the atmosphere of pure experience. Experience is the very life, the self-conscious life of science. And of such life the scientist agonizingly exclaims, "'Tis life whereof our nerves are scant, O life, not death, for which we pant, More life and fuller that I want." Then he is told by a philosopher, who desires a rapprochement between his philosophy and science, that in a very real sense the present experience of the veriest unenlightened ditch digger does philosophic justice to the earlier reality in a way which the scientific statement does not and cannot cannot that is as formulated knowledge i presume that the ditch digger is dignified with laudatory mention and disparagement of the scientist because the ditch becomes real in the digging experience while the fossil does not if the geologist could only dig his fossils in while he is digging them out then his pure digging experience would do philosophic justice to the reality. Where else should the nature of fossils be realized save in experience, and in the very experience in which fossils as knowledge objects are present? This kind of pure experience, however, would probably be branded by professional geologists as impure science. It is well enough to lay emphasis on the experience of the scientist as indispensable to the scientific validity of his results. When we do, we get what I have ventured to call an epistemological idealism, or the doctrine that there would be no scientific reality were there no scientists, with scientific ideas and ideational experiences. If there were a universe of real things which did not include somewhere or some time within it cognitive experience of at least some part of it, and which were so completely self-contained that no thinker of another universe could even guess its existence, the reality of that universe could not be scientific reality, whatever else in its meaninglessness it might be. Even the idolist dream of such a universe would require a dream experience, for which it could have a quasi-reality. The reality we know and the reality we predicate with any intelligibility or significance is reality for us as predicators. Even when we think of this kind of reality as being possible in another universe unradiated by a single gleam of intelligence or sense experience, we still are thinking of it. We cannot think ourselves and everything else out of such a universe without being in this universe to do the thinking anyway. No thinker, no thought object, no experience somewhere and some when, no meaningful reality anywhere and any time. This is the truth which is contained in Professor Dewey's contention. But it is one thing to say no experience, no reality, and it is another thing to say no contemporaneous experience, no reality. It is this contemporaneousness that Professor Dewey surreptitiously introduces into the statement of the truth, thereby converting it into, well, let us say a huge assumption. Thus the knowledge object always carries along contemporaneously with itself an other something to which it is relevant and accountable, and whose union with it affords the condition of its testing, its correction and verification. This union is intimate and complete, the distinction in experience between the knowledge portion as such and its own experience content as non-cognitional is a reflective, analytic distinction, itself real in its experience content and function. Footnote. All the italics are mine, except the last. End footnote. By thus synchronizing the experience and the reality, the object of knowledge, which for the scientific geologist may be a real object, belonging to the remote past, becomes so tied down to the present by the fact that it is cognitively experienced that it loses the character of past reality which it claims to have for scientific knowledge. Knowledge of the past becomes a self-contradictory thing. To use expression of Bosanquet's, the time of judgment and the time in judgment get so badly mixed that they must be reduced to the same time, the time of judging. Lutz's view that the ways of thought and the ways of things are different, is ridiculed out of court to make way for the sole alternative view, which regards reality as developing in and through judgment. Footnote. Dr. Helen Bradford Thompson, in Studies in Logical Theory, page 126. End footnote. The development of our ideas of reality and the development of reality itself are economically merged into one development, the development of objects in our cognitive experience of them. Let us now follow the results of this merger. I think we shall see that the stock of the holding company rises 
at the expense of the manipulated stock, which falls to zero. In geology, the scientist deals with facts cognized as prior to his cognizing experience of them. Professor Dewey tries to acknowledge this. He goes as far as his theory will allow him. But his theory will not allow him to regard the geological fact as complete reality. It is simply reality in the process of transformation towards experience. This process of transformation towards reality is a fact as objectively real as anything else, and is realized in present experience. Hence, what is omitted from reality, in the scientist's statement of the nature of the object, is always restored in the experience in which that fact is present. In dealing with reality in the process of transformation towards experience, if, dropping out the first hyphen, you try the experiment of the chopping off of the non-contemporaneously experienced earlier reality from later experience, you do violence to the pragmatic variety of empiricism with its interpretation of the place of reflective knowledge or thought in control of experience. And you must remember that this pragmatic variety of empiricism seems to have the call here. If you put down your axe and let the hyphen be, that hyphen will wreck every fortune that is tied up in strictly objectivistic realisms. The real trouble with this pragmatic variety of empiricism is that it is so much engaged in the business of the interpretation of the place of reflective knowledge or thought in the control of experience that it ignores the right of the object to the place it claims, a place in time prior to the date of the experience. It claims that place not as an incomplete reality, but as a genuine ready-made reality, waiting all these ages to be recognized as such. The recognition does not, in the knowing experience, pretend to give reality to what it recognizes as real, any more than the registration of a deed of conveyance with the registrar of deeds makes the deed real. The deed is already real, or no registrar registering to doomsday can register reality into it. The pragmatist of Professor Dewey's type of empiricism writes as if a change in geological science involved a change in the actual past history of geological objects. But I am afraid that he would find it hard to make terms with the scientific geologist on the proposition that the discovery of geological development made that development real. The geologist would be unkind enough to say that discovery is not invention. The map of the past may be changed after the discovery, but that does not change the real past. If the map becomes more accurate in the effort of reflective knowledge to control present experience, that is because there was a real past now fixed in its eternal state which one map can more truthfully represent than another. It would be a queer sort of past that should complacently adjust itself to conform to every change that the cartographer felt obliged to make in the effort to reintegrate his pure experience of cartographical distractions. Or let us take the momentous day when Copernicus first hit upon his famous reintegration of astronomical experience after Ptolemaic tensions. Was the real Earth at that time uprooted out of its place in the center of the universe and sent spinning in an elliptical orbit about the sun. Mighty as was the thought of Copernicus, it would be hard to suppose that it could suddenly impart a motion of many miles per second to the huge masses of the Earth and the other planets, and cap the climax by performing the miracle of Joshua. The scientist is more apt to suppose that the real solar system at that moment kept on in the equable course it had been pursuing for countless millenniums, and that it did not feel a single tremor throughout its whole frame, save in the little nervous system of Copernicus himself. In all these pre-Copernican aeons, where was the other which the knowledge object of Copernicus had always carried along contemporaneously with itself? Had Copernicus's experience existed continuously through all pre-Copernican times? Or did the knowledge object of Copernicus not exist except contemporaneously with historical Copernicus? I must confess that the attempt to think out this puzzle in terms of the pragmatic variety of empiricism with its interpretation of the place of reflective knowledge or thought in control of experience, gives me a pure experience of tension and distraction, of particular elements which are in strife. The facts I seem to get are crude, raw, unorganized, brute. They lack relationship, that is, assured place in the universe. They are deficient as to continuity. Footnote, Studies in Logical Theory, page 52. End footnote. And this, I am told, is an index of pragmatic untruth. But we are assured that we can escape all this difficulty by recognizing the objects prior to Copernicus as incompletely real. The real is a sop to science. The incompletely is the acknowledgment of the truth of the pragmatic variety of empiricism. This seems to be an easy way out of the difficulty, 
But let us look ahead a little before committing ourselves to this reconciliation of science and philosophy. The non-contemporaneously experienced earlier reality is not complete reality because it is undergoing change in the direction of, which is, to say the least, as objectively real as anything else. Does this not prove too much? The function of the solar system as an object of knowledge was not exhausted in the experience of Copernicus. It continues in the experience of every educated man today. If it be said that what is continuously undergoing transformation in the direction of is not complete, the solar system is incomplete yet, because it seems to be undergoing just such a hyphenated transformation every day. And it is hard to fix the term of that transformation before Byron's last man shall have found surcease for his unshared sorrows in the grave of all experience. And yet even then, the solar system cannot be real, for the experience which is necessary to realize it is gone. We thus get the interesting result that nothing can be completely real till nothing is left to be possibly real. No wonder that the philosopher whose view of complete reality involves this paradox should have found that the paradox wrecks all strictly objectivistic realisms. But why does he not see that every other ism shares the same fate? But it may be argued that, although pure experientialism may be a floating mine which wrecks the whole philosophic navy in exploding itself, still any other philosophic doctrine negatives the value and the reality of thought. The reply is, not in the least, unless by reality is meant the whole universe, past, present, and to come, and by value is meant inclusiveness of such total reality. Thought may be real without being omnitudo realitatis. It may be an integral part of the universe, with its definite place in time and its definite work to do. What its place is, is scientifically determined, as everything is properly determined in science, by appeal to the witness of harmonized and reintegrated experience. Experience assigns to itself a place in the world of reality, as posterior to much of the reality experienced in scientific ideation. Experience also recognizes its own function in the world, just as it recognizes the function of other parts of the whole of reality. When it recognizes itself as necessary for the recognition of reality, it recognizes in itself a unique value. But if it tries to emancipate itself from the duties of its sphere and to usurp the function of another sphere, it makes itself a laughingstock, much as the would-be male females of our time do. Even though experience is bone of the bones and flesh of the flesh of reality, still she ought to realize that there were some real ribs whose prior existence was necessary to her making. She may give names to the animals brought before her, but if she arrogates to herself the power of giving reality to the very conditions that brought her into being, she is trying to become greater than Spinoza's God, who is merely causa sui. She wants to become causa causae sui, Experience may look before and after, but she may not translocate. She may embrace the real, but not reduce it to a dependency of herself. If it be asked how the real, which may exist prior to experience, can come to be an object of subsequent experience of it, unless the obsolete doctrine of representative knowledge be true, I should answer that perhaps there is more truth in that doctrine than many would be disposed to acknowledge today. Let us look at experience as it actually is and see what are the facts. At present, I am experiencing my typewriter, i.e. there is awareness of it along with other things, among which is a group of contents called by Professor James the empirical me. The awareness comprehends them all, including many relations subsisting between them severally and collectively. The awareness is not in any one of them, but of them together. These various things do not exist for the awareness as borrowing their reality from it. They exist for it as just being there in various relations to each other. The awareness as embracing the color and the shape of the typewriter is called seeing it, as embracing the hardness of the keys is called touching them. What is thus seen and touched stands in bold relief in space before my body. Now let me close my eyes and raise my fingers. There is a change in the field of objects. Instead of the thing in clear outlines, there is now something of which I am aware as similar what was before my body a while ago, but also as somehow different. What I formerly experienced is not now present, along with this new something, but by its presence furnishing one of the relata for the relation of similarity. On the contrary, I am aware only of this new something as similar, and yet as different. The thing it resembles and does not entirely resemble is absent from my awareness as a definite content of my present experience. 
but I know that it was experienced only a moment ago. Now I move my fingers, still keeping my eyes closed. I again become aware of the kind of hardness I experienced a moment ago when I touched the keys before. The present hardness is much more similar to that previous hardness than the present color I see with closed lids is to the color viewed with open eyes. The keys I still see are ghostly white and black. The fingers I see are ghostly fingers, but the hardness I feel is not ghostly. Now this object of my vision so sickly o'er with the pale cast of thought is called a visual image, corresponding to and resembling the thing I saw once and can again see, if only I open my eyes. The image is, moreover, not merely something in the field of vision. It is there a standing for something else, for what is called the real typewriter, which I can see and do touch. I know the reality through this image. If you ask me what is the color of the typewriter frame, I answer black. I see the black of my image, and it means the black of the real typewriter. In this case, unquestionably, I know the reality through the image. I can do so because I am aware of the resemblance the image has to the real typewriter, which I saw a moment ago standing in its naked reality before my eyes. If I were to doubt the resemblance, I should only have to open my eyes, and lo, the real thing would stand revealed as having just the color I attributed to it, because I saw that color in the image. That is to say, when my eyes are closed, I have a representative visual image of the reality I have previously seen face to face. It is to be noted that such representative knowledge differs greatly from the representative knowledge of the school of Hamilton. Hamilton thought that the thing we saw with open eyes was not the real thing. It was merely a replica of the real thing. Hence he believed that all our knowledge is representative. According to the account given above, not all knowledge is representative. The knowledge of the real thing's visual characters, which we get when our eyes are open, is direct and immediate. It is intuitive. It is only when my eyes are closed that I have to depend upon representative knowledge. Now as I can have both intuitive and representative knowledge of reality, and as I can be aware of the similarity or dissimilarity between them, I can, when I have intuitive knowledge, test the correctness of the representative knowledge I previously had. The arguments, therefore, which have been directed against the theory of the representative character of all knowledge lose their force when turned against the asserted fact of the representative character of a large part of our knowledge. If we call this representative part of our knowledge knowing the external world through ideas which are merely within us, it is hard to see the justification which Professor Dewey has for saying that such knowledge is an inherent self-contradiction. The question, however, may properly be asked whether the image is merely within us. Answering from experience, I should say that it is. I have never found any reason for supposing that the image can exist apart from the awareness of it. And I presume that by merely existing within us, Professor Dewey means existing only when there is an awareness of what exists. On the other hand, I think that I have good reason for believing that the real thing I see continues to exist when I no longer see it when I do not even think of it, and when, so far as I know, no one experiences it in any way. The trouble with Hamilton's school is that having convinced themselves that some of our knowledge is representative, they allow themselves to infer that all knowledge is representative. The trouble with philosophers of Professor Dewey's way of thinking is that having convinced themselves that some of our knowledge is not representative, and that if all our knowledge were representative, we should never have any criterion for truth, they jump to the conclusion that none of our knowledge is representative. If people would only give up trying to reduce all knowledge to a dull uniformity of character and would describe facts as they are, we should have neither the insoluble problem of proving copies authentic when we can never get at the originals, nor the anti-scientific view that things are real only in experience and that real things change when our purely experienced images of them change, and that the changes of these images are the changes of the things. The theory above, outlining as to the partially intuitive and partially representative character of our knowledge, makes possible a meaning of transubjective reference, which accords with the facts and does not involve contradictions. By transubjective reference, according to this theory, is meant reference to what exists beyond the direct object of awareness when that object is merely subjective. When I close my eyes and remove my fingers from the keys of my typewriter, 
I am aware of images, which are called merely subjective because they are supposed to have no existence except as they appear in consciousness. But I am also aware of a reference of these images to what is not now directly present in consciousness, viz. my typewriter. This transsubjective reference finds its simplest illustration in memory. The thing remembered and the image present in consciousness when we remember are of course not the same thing. We cannot literally recall our boyhood days, but we do have images which, however, are not mere images and nothing more. We have images which reproduce, with some verisimilitude, those bygone days. Not only is there reproduction, there is also recognition of the past experience. The images come to us in the character of representatives, present ambassadors bearing credentials from a court which has long been leveled in the dust of time. But we honor the credentials and treat the embassy with all the consideration due to the power they represent. This treatment of the present image as representative of a past reality is a transsubjective reference. The image is a relatum in relation to a non-existent correlatum. We might call the relation, so far as the immediate contents of experience are concerned, a one-term relation. The other term is not present in the pure experience of the moment. But its absence does not mar the character of the present term as a related term recognized as such. There is pure experience of reference, too. And if the phrase is to be completed, the completement lies beyond the immediate experience. An image thus referred to what is not present in consciousness to complete the reference is what I would call an idea. All our reminiscent knowledge is by means of ideas. Now, if we may know the past, of which we are no longer immediately aware, by means of ideas, why may we not know present objects, of which we are not immediately aware, in the same way? At present, for instance, I have an image of my bed in another room. The image is not my bed, and the bed is not an object of my immediate pure experience while I am writing. Nevertheless, the image refers to the real bed, now existing in the same way in which the memory refers to something not itself, something not now existing but having existed in the past. The fact that in the one case the object referred to is past, and in the other case exists simultaneously with the image, does not make any difference in the transsubjective character of the reference. If it be asked how I know that the bed is up in my room, a distinct reality from my image of it as my body sits here at my writing table, I should say that Hume has fairly stated the facts on which my belief in this distinction rests, although of course Hume did not think that the belief was logically valid. The belief was for him a mere fiction of the imagination. But for him, when he was consistent, the memory image had no transsubjective reference either. Whether we call the motive which prompts to the belief an instinct, or reason, or common sense, the fact is that the belief is in normal experience present, and no argument can be given for its untenableness which does not at the same time assume its tenableness and its correctness. Now, just as I have memory images referred to realities previously experienced, and just as I have images referring to present realities not immediately experienced, so I can have images referring to past or future realities which have never been experienced. The fall of Constantinople, the martyrdom of Bruno, the next 4th of July, and my deathbed experience are all present to me by representative images. I know them, more or less accurately, by means of ideas. All my knowledge of the past, all my forecast of the future, and all my knowledge of facts now existing save the few I have before me in the way of sense perception inner and outer are representative. Bosenkett, therefore, does not seem to be far from the truth when he says that we come into contact with reality in sense perception. Everywhere else we have images referring to reality, ideas of reality, but not reality itself. If I read Professor James aright, this view is not far from his, yet it differs from his in one important respect. He seems to make the truth of experience where substitutional images are employed to consist in the fact that these images do actually continue uninterrupted into the experience where the reality becomes an object of sense perception. I should rather say that one important test of my imaging experience is found in subsequent or prior sense perceptions. The truth of the images, however, consists in the correspondence of the images with a transsubjective reality 
which now exists, or with a transsubjective reality, which has existed in the past, or will exist in the future. Whether ever actually an object of immediate experience or not, the sense perception confirms the truth, but is not the truth. Truth is the agreement between ideas and reality. Such agreement does not necessitate exact correspondence, point for point, between images and reality. But for truth, there must be correspondence in regard to the feature which is transsubjectively referred. End of Pure Experience and Reality by Evander Bradley McGilvery